I'm Sister Simone Campbell. I'm the Executive Director of Network, Lobby for Catholic Social Justice, and have some fame for uh, being the leader of Nuns on the Bus. And we work in Washington, D.C. to advocate on Capitol Hill. We educate across the country, and we organize to create just legislation, or at least to work in that direction. This COVID moment has highlighted what have been fissures, small little cracks in our society for years, but have heightened them and expanded them. Things like income and wealth disparity, the issues around housing, who has a house they can hunker down in, issues like the rise of misinformation that we don't even, tr we can't even trust the information that our leaders are giving us and we don't know who to trust. Um, there's, and that results in a lack of trust in institutions. So we feel this hyper individualism where people are feeling like they have to protect their families because nobody else will. This exas this COVID-19 has exacerbated that painful reality of individualism in our society. And the fact is, this is the very moment where we ought to see our in interdependence, our connectedness, our reliance on each other, that none of us can be virus free unless we all are. And that's the, oh, the painful mystery of this moment is that we're turning a bl blind eye to the interdependence because of our fear, I think. Even in this very distant time, what we're doing is uh, helping our people, our members across the country, do virtual meetings with staff and members of Congress to express what is actually happening in their communities. Let me give you an example. Um, the, we got a call fairly early on from one of a, a, a farmer, a dairy farmer, who had been involved in our Rural Roundtable series last year. And she was just in tears because she was having to dump her milk because her cows were producing milk, but they couldn't convert the, the uh, packaging place fast enough to bigger half gallons, gallon containers that they could use in uh, markets. But I had not realized that like 40, 45% of the milk drunk in our nation was drunk in schools and they needed all these little containers. Well, the little containers didn't work in the grocery store. So because the supply chain was broken, they were told to dump their milk. And she knew there were people who were hungry, who needed milk. And she just called in tears. And so what we try to do is connect our people with the realities on Capitol Hill so that they can tell their stories. And this is the kind of thing that we need to wake up to. We are connected, but the dislocation that's going on is so painful. Additionally, folks like the, the folks in the meatpacking plants that were ordered back to work in very hot spots, volatile, dangerous places. Why and were they ordered back? Because apparently we care more about meat than we care about health. And that is certainly the place of the privileged to care about meat. And so we've tried to lift this up and get the stories out about the consequences of this. Mm -hmm. So there's been some progress. Uh, some of the pieces passed by Congress have made, you know, taken steps towards some healing. But now the fracture, the fear is so intense, the entitlement is so intense that I am concerned that that shared commitment to a shared common good is beginning to erode. And so we're now trying to talk, with, especially in the Senate, with Senate staff about this awareness of, for me, it's about faith, but it's also about the Constitution. How do we form this more perfect union? I think when the COVID-19 uh, illness started, there was less knowledge and therefore more coming together. 
there was a sense of shared threat that brought us together. And we were really groping in the dark together to try to find a way forward. And so both in Democratic and Republican offices, we found a receptivity of listening to about the stories of the folks that have lost their jobs, about businesses that have closed, about healthcare in crises, especially at the community health centers and the federally qualified health centers, the FQHCs, which are so economically stressed. And so there was great unanimity in the beginning and for the first maybe month and a half. But what's happened more recently now that, well, we're doing this in mid-May, is that that sense of shared concern, shared involvement is eroding um, as we as we work on this because I think the narrative that the that the economy is more important than our people, or the economy is something separate from our people. That's the one that just really confuses me no end, because how can you have an economy if you don't have people? And in our faith tradition, Pope Francis makes it abundantly clear that our capitalist economy is good for many things, but it is not good for caring for those most at the margins, whom we now call essential workers. And so what we're trying to do is to help ease some of the fear so that there's more room in people's hearts to engage the deeper and bigger story of our time. And I think it, it really does require personal fear to lessen so that compassion can rise up again. we see in the Senate with the Republican-led Senate and the priority of the economy and the utter disregard for science or for um, uh, expertise, for, for professionals, is about a insecurity, really, of needing to have the bravado and the political gamesmanship and it is games manship to claim their space and need to one up anyone that comes before them. I mean, it, it's sad, but it's true. And for me, that comes out of an insecurity. But this other place where I think we need to look at is that I've been told by uh, senators, their Republican women senators have told me that uh, ordinary senator or, you know, senators don't meet with ordinary people. They only meet with their donors. And that it's about who they listen to makes the difference. And that's why our, I think our work is so important because we try to get other stories into, the, um, into their world so that they can hear the deeper truths about our nation and not take, because we all take whoever we hear as being our world and that our world gets you know, expanded outward. But the fact is, the world is much more complex than what they hear. And so I'm sure he hasn't heard about the story about the woman dairy farmer. I'm sure he hasn't heard the story of the, the frontline workers who are having to drive buses, even in the midst of the pandemic, or serve at grocery stores. It just doesn't enter their world. And if it doesn't enter their world, it can't enter their heart. And so... Those some people tell me that uh, when I say it doesn't enter their hearts, they say it assumes, my favorite objection in the law is that it assumes a fact, not an evidence, that they have a heart. So um, <laughs> we try, we try to get other stories that expand their view of who we the people are. I think the men of the Senate, especially the Republican men, are um, mostly white, mostly used to privilege, and uh, mostly wealthy, and therefore have a sense of entitlement. And quite frankly, the we lobbyists kind of contribute to that because we want their votes. And so we're not going to be too... Uh, it's rare to be really super strong against them. We always try, I always try in my lobbying efforts to say, well, no, isn't that an interesting point, but have you considered 
and try to expand it a little bit without saying, you are nuts. <laughs> and that doesn't get us too far. So we're trying to create relationship, which for fellowship of reconciliation, isn't that what it's about? Create relationship without being dissing. It's just sometimes it gets to me, the, the entitlement is painful to watch. In a post-COVID world, I hope we emerge with a greater respect and treasuring of relationship and connections and the capacity just to embrace or uh, welcome, to hug. I I'm a very tactile person. And for me, often when I talk to people, I reach out and touch their arm or I you know, want to be in proximity. I want to have that human. Isn't that to be human? Is to have our spirits, yes, which we can do through Zoom and electronically and all this, but we're physical beings for a reason. So I hope we treasure, treasure that physical connection. And my hope is that we see that we are all connected, that the racial divides, the economic divides, we have a mandate to change. We can bridge those chasms. It is possible. Policy got us into this mess. Policy can get us out of it. We can make change if I have a strong enough sense that you and I are connected. And if I hold hands with you and you hold hands beyond that, that we can build this connected world. That's my hope. Okay, so then what's my fear? I probably should have done fears first and ended with hope. But my uh, fears are that we are so crippling our institutions. We're so, our, our government institutions, which is our agreed contract of how we take care of each other is through government, is so undermined and so demoralized. I worry that we will not have institutions to stand up. I worry that our healthcare systems uh, will not be able to be sustained in this time. I worry that our private sense of wealth and privilege is taken as the dominant narrative and we have no sense of responsibility for each other. It is shocking to me that not everyone in the United States has access to healthcare. This, I hope, changes. And I also hope that we once again realize the importance of frontline workers who are paid minimum wage, minimum wage for heaven's sakes. Pope Francis makes it abundantly clear everyone should be able to work a 40 hour week, be paid enough to care for their family and to live in dignity, to have a little bit of recreation and to even save for retirement. That is a Christian value. I'm afraid we're nowhere near that. But maybe when we come out and finally touch each other, finally be able to hug and hold each other, maybe it'll wake our hearts and we'll make change. I think the critical thing in this moment is to maintain our compassion. And that fear has a tendency to shut it down because I get worried about me or mine. But in this moment, in our nation and in our world, it's we. We. None of us are isolates. And this is the very time to realize that we're woven together in a single fabric. And my Christian tradition says it's we're one body. Another image I love is that, you know, the vine and the branches, we're all connected. We have to remember that. And that keeps our heart open and hope alive. Because while we're together, we can make a difference. Well, it's a treasure to share with you a prayer I wrote last week, um, just trying to reflect on this time of COVID-19 and, and the, the state we're in. And it's, I have a, my community is dedicated to the Holy Spirit. And so this prayer is directed to the Holy Spirit who 
uh, nurtures all of life, who is the breath among us, in my view. So let me share this. So let us pray. O oh, Spirit, in the very first stanza of Genesis, in the very first book of the Bible, it is recounted that you hovered over the waters of chaos and over time brought forth a new creation. As the coronavirus spreads chaos and fear across our world, breathe over these waters of chaos and bring forth something new. O oh, Spirit, Open our eyes that we might see anew the intricate web of relationships that make us one creation. Open our eyes that we might see that we are all brothers and sisters, one family. Open our eyes that we might see anew the beauty of our one family, this treasured creation. O oh, Spirit, Open our ears that we might hear the cries of those who are lost and forgotten. Open our ears that we might hear the encouragement of our brothers and sisters. Open our ears that we might hear your wee small voice within this chaotic time. O oh, Spirit, open our hands, unclench them when we tighten up in anxiety and worry. Open our hands that while we cannot touch, we can reach out, wave, be connected. Open our hands that we might find a way to support, create, endure when we feel alone. O oh, Spirit, breathe over the waters of chaos and call forth a new creation. Call us to be alive in our connection with each other, even though we are distanced. Let us know our oneness in you. Let this moment be a new beginning where we live in you with insight, generosity, and compassion. Please make of us a new creation in this time of chaos. O oh, Spirit. Amen. Amen.